Okay, we're going to look at another example, finding local extrema and saddle points of a function. And you'll notice this is another nice polynomial function. So differentiable everywhere, no places where I should expect derivatives to not exist. Uh, and we should, everything should turn out pretty nice on this one. Um, all right, so I'm going to start with my partial derivatives and set each of those equal to zero. In that last video, I started with a gradient vector and I set the gradient vector equal to zero. But then we went to that step where we pulled out each component. And so we're really just looking at where each partial derivative uh, is equal to zero. Okay, so I just need to take my partial derivatives correctly. If you mess up this step, that messes up everything else, so be careful here. Uh, let's see, so I'll have 1x squared, and then again, I'm differentiating with respect to x here, so plus 4y minus 9. I'm going to set that equal to 0, and my partial derivative with respect to y. So I'll have 4x minus 2y, and I'm going to set that equal to 0. Okay, and here we are solving a system again. Uh, in the last video, we had a system that decoupled or separated uh, because we had one equation that completely involved x and the other equation that completely involved y, and there was no um, equation that involved both variables here. But this one does not do that. It is not a decoupled system. So it will be important as we work through the algebra here to pay attention to what that means in terms of what our critical points are. Um, but I am going to go through the algebra here and solve this system. So we have a lot of tools for solving systems of equations. It's a nonlinear system, uh, so matrix methods are not going to be helpful. Um, but you can use elimination or substitution or whatever method's appropriate. I probably would use substitution on this one. I would notice that the second equation is pretty easy to solve for x or y and then substitute into the first equation. So I'll go ahead and do that. You want to be careful that you don't make sign errors or coefficient errors as you do this. So if you need to write out more algebra than I'm going to write out here, please do that. I just need to save enough space because it gets kind of long in the end here. Um, all right, so if I take this second equation and I solve for y, maybe I'll add 2y to both sides of the equation and then divide through by 2. So I'll get 2x equals y from the second equation. And then I'm going to substitute into the first equation. I'm going to put 2x in place of y in the first equation, uh, so we can go through that algebra there. We'll eliminate a variable by doing that. So I'll have x squared plus 4 times 2x, so plus 8x minus 9 equals 0. This is quadratic. It factors pretty easily. x plus 9 times x minus 1, and set each factor equal to 0, and we'll get x equals negative 9 and x equals 1. Okay, so those are both x coordinates. Remember, my critical points are going to be x, y points, inputs for my function here. Uh, so just paying attention to labels, you know, in algebra in high school or whenever you first did algebra, uh, you might have just written negative 9, comma 1 and not written x equals. But here, when we've got a system and lots of variables, it's important to keep track uh, that those are x values. The other important thing about this problem is that because this system does not decouple, each of these x values will have specific y values that go with it. In the last example we looked at, I got two x values and two y values, and I just took all the different combinations of those for my critical points because any of those combinations made my gradient vector equal to zero. But here, I need to make sure that when x is negative 9, I have the correct y value with that that's going to be the critical point for that. So keeping track of the algebra here and just thinking about what it is that's happening here as you do your work uh, will help you make sure that you handle that correctly. All right, so when x is negative 9, I could really use any of these equations, but I'm going to use this one right here uh, that I got from that second equation where I have y equals 2x. So I'm going to use that. So when x is negative 9, the y that value that will go with that is 2 times negative 9, so negative 18. Those two values go together. When x is 1, my y value that will go with that is 2, just putting x equals 1 in here. And so that y value needs to go with this x value. So I'm not going to make different combinations here like x equals negative 9 and y equals 2 
like I did in that last vi video. Um, so the key here is thinking about whether those equations decouple or not, whether your x value depends on a particular y value or vice versa or not. So for this one, I really just have two critical points. So I'm going to make my chart again here. So negative 9, negative 18, and 1, 2. And then again, in order to classify those critical points as locations of maxima, minima, or saddle points, we're going to use the D function here. So second pure partial with respect to x. So here I've used my label here, which is helpful when you go to find that second derivative. Here's my first derivative of f with respect to x. So I need to differentiate this equation with respect to x again. So I'll get 2x times the second pure partial with respect to y. So again, my label here helps. Here's my first derivative with respect to y. So when I, when I differentiate that with respect to y, I'll get negative 2 minus, and then the mixed second derivative, the product of the two mixed second derivatives, but they will be equal. So we often just write one of them squared. Uh, so if I differentiate this one with respect to y, I get 4, and that needs to be squared. Uh, so there's my d function. The last one we looked at had 0 in this mixed second derivative uh, part. Um, but when the logic is the same, kind of thinking through what this tells me about what's going on, I'm just going to plug these points in. You'll notice in this one I don't have any y's in here, so it just depends on really plugging in the x. It just turned out to be that way. Uh, so when I put this in, again, I don't really care so much about what the number for the answer is as I care about whether I have positives or negatives. So when I put in x equals negative 9, I'm going to leave this fairly unsimplified here. I'll have negative 18 times negative 2, and then minus 4 squared. I'll just make that negative 16. So I need to think about not just these individual parts. Remember that last video, we had this last term being 0 here. I need to think about not just the individual parts. The first thing I need to think about is this whole product, whether this whole expression is positive or negative. So I do need to think about that negative 18 times negative 2 is positive 36, and then minus 16, that gives me a positive 20. So this whole expression here is positive. That tells us that we have an extremum, not a saddle point. Um, and so then it's just a question of classifying what type we have. And on our theorem, it talks about using that second pure partial with respect to x, which if you leave your d function unsimplified will be right here, or right here. So this being positive, the d function being positive, 36 minus 16 is 20, so positive, tells us that I have an extremum, and then to determine which type of extremum it is, I need to look at the concavity. Really, I could look at that in the x or y direction. Our theorem talks about the second pure partial with respect to x. In that case, is negative, and so the graph is concave down. In the last video, because this last term was 0, we were able to just think about the whole d function being positive or negative and concave down. Um, so just kind of talking about this, we've got concave down in both the x and y directions. And then this mixed second derivative really has to do with how the slopes of those tangent lines change. So if I think about slopes in the x direction, and then I let y vary, how those slopes change, so whether those slopes get bigger or smaller. So this mixed second partial derivative is a little bit more difficult to see on the graph unless you have some animation kind of looking at how those slopes change. But the key thing is here that you've got some different things going on in the x and y directions perhaps, but at that point we're concave down overall. So I've got an extremum concave down, so if you think about visualizing a function that's concave down, that tells you that your type of critical point right there will be a maximum. All right, and then at 1, 2, so I'm going to go ahead and plug those in to my d function here. So when I put in x equals 1, I'll get um, 2 times negative 2 minus 16. This d function is negative. Okay, so what that means is that I have different concavity going on in different directions. Um, the thing about the mixed second partial, sometimes you can have the same concavity going on in the x and y direction, but then if you think about going in some other direction, you've got some other strange behavior going on. So that's what this mixed second 
partial derivative picks up is what happens in other directions. It's not just strictly the x direction or strictly the y direction. All right, but because this d function is negative, it tells me I have different things going on in different directions, so we have a saddle point. All right, again, just to make sure that we answer the question correctly, it's asking us to find local extrema, so those are output values. And then for saddle points, x, y, z, when you think about a point, that would be an x, y, z value. So that has to do with how the question's asked. If it asks you just to find the critical points and determine them as locations of maxima, minima, or saddle points, I would be done right here. But because it says to find the local extrema, I need to actually state that. So this one has a local maximum, no local minimum, and then a saddle point. So we'll go ahead and write the answers down here. The local maximum of this function is f of, so remember those are outputs, negative 9, negative 18. So you put negative 9, negative 18 into your function and you do some computation and you get 162. And then I've got a saddle point. And that is an x, y, z coordinate, so 1, 2. And then to find a z coordinate, I'm going to put 1, 2 into my function and do the computation. I get negative 14 thirds. Uh, so our local maximum is 162. I might say it occurs at negative 9, negative 18. But this is actually the, what it asked for. And then the saddle point is here. And again, I've labeled my answers here so it's clear which answer is for which part. All right, we're going to go look at this on the graph. Uh, the scale is going to have to be a little bit crazy here because I've got an output value of 162. I need to be able to see, and an output value of negative 14 thirds I need to be able to see. And then my x and y window has to be big enough that I can see these x and y coordinates on the graph. So, okay, so here I've graphed the function, and I had to spend quite a while messing with the scale on the axes so that we could see both of the critical points in the same window. And it looks kind of weird because our scale on our different axes is so different. Um, but you can see here I've got my x min going from negative 15 to an x max of 5, and y going from negative 25 to 5, z going from negative 10 to 170, so I can see all my critical points and the outputs at those critical points. And then I also fiddled a little bit with this scale factor so that when we go from, say, negative 10 to 170, we've got reasonable size tick marks here. Uh, and I plotted our point, so it's a little bit hard on this one to see everything all at once. So I'm going to zoom in a little bit closer to each of the points here. So I'm going to move this surface down so we can see the maximum point and zoom in a little bit closer to that. All right, so if we rotate around, rotate the surface around, you can see that we've got kind of in all directions, that's the highest point, at least in that region on the surface. And then if I zoom back out, Zoom back out so we can see the saddle point. All right, and I'll put that saddle point closer to the center of the screen here and zoom back in. All right, so at the saddle point, uh, that's kind of the one that's a little bit more interesting to look at. When you look at it from one view, it looks like it's a minimum. So you can see that in that view, the graph looks concave up in that view. Uh, but then when I rotate around a little bit more, you can see that the graph looks concave down in that region, so it looks like a maximum in that region when you look at it kind of where you can see both those things going on. You can see that it looks like a saddle point right there. Um, so anyway, you don't have to look at these graphs, but it can be helpful, especially if it's kind of not making sense to graph it. Uh, it's not necessary that you show all of the critical points in the same view, um, but it can be helpful to look at that a little bit. So you should try some relative extrema problems, and then after you've tried some of those, then you should go on to the videos about absolute extrema.